Well, Hillary, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk about all the things. Um, you came out with your sobriety story about six months ago. You're 15 years sober. So I'll be asking, you know, telling people that you're so sober is a total coming out process. Yeah, it is. Con continually. So we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to get into yeah. it. Yeah. So fun. Um, and of course you're Michael's Michael Phillips' sister. So we're just throwing that out there where this is not about him. This is going to be about you, but I think it'll be interesting to talk about your story because you have had some really unique and interesting experiences. So, but we're going to tell it through the, the lens of Hillary, not, <laughs> not anybody else. <laughs> so to warm up, we're going to play a little game called the lightning round, which is very slow. I'm certain that my listeners are so sick of hearing me say that, but you want to play? I do. Let's go. <laughs> so do you have a favorite book that helped you early in recovery? So early in recovery, I loved, it's called drinking a love story by Carolyn Knapp. Um, and for me, it was, have you heard of this? Oh yeah. Uh, I'm giggling because so many people, there weren't a lot of books and this one gets mentioned a lot. So early in sobriety, I went to um, the bookstore and I went and I was like, I'm going to figure this thing out. Like, I'm going to figure out why I have it. I'm going to figure out how I can solve it. I'm going to figure out what to do about it. And I bought like what to do, not that how, to, um, what to do the first, what to expect the first year of sobriety, what to, like drinking a love story, like bought all of these books. And it was just, there were very few, I think there were like three or four that I found 15 years ago. Wow. Um, but that was the best one. And I often offer that I give that out to women that are new in sobriety. Cause it's so good. I think she's a great writer. It was really helpful. Um, but now I love my favorite book now that's been the most helpful. I think of any book I've read is, um, change your, change your paradigm, change your life. Ooh. Bob, Proctor. Bob Proctor girl. You're now you're going to, we're going to go down this rabbit hole because the whole like change your mind, change your life thing is like, I didn't know when I found out that if you change the way you thought, changed your mindset, like that is at the root of everything that you experience it and that there becomes empowering right? Oh, for sure. Versus like a victim. Yeah. Oh man. That victim mentality. You know, what's weird is sometimes you don't even know you're in it until someone points it out. You're so rude. <laughs> spiritual, <laughs> spiritual rudeness. Um, I'm going to pause this real quick. Do you happen to have Okay. So do you have a go-to mantra or quote that you live by? Oh my gosh, now in the moment, I have a mantra that I was given to me in my, I lived in an ashram. So I was given a personal mantra that I say when I meditate. Um, but a quote that I love, there are a couple, I love be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, there's a Deepak Chopra that's before all chaos precedes all change. Um, there's something it's before all great chaos precedes all great change or so, there's something I'll have to figure out this. Um, so clearly I don't use that one very much. I love it, but I can't forget it. I can't remember <laughs> what it was. No, that's a really good one. I mean, that sort of speaks to what we're talking about here today is like addiction is very chaotic, but sometimes it's the most chaotic just before we're ready to change. And that's, it's all great change is preceded by chaos. There you go. That's alcoholism in a nutshell. And one more is, um, we we're all, we're all geniuses, but if you judge a fish's ability to climb a tree, he's a failure or something, you know, and it talks about how we're all great at something, but we can't compare ourselves to others because greatness is like within each of us. I love that one. I, that is such a good reminder because there are so many people with so many great talents. It's, it's easy to be tempted to think, oh, if I don't have that talent, that must mean I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Genius, genius lies within. I love that. Um, let's talk a little bit about your self-care practice. Do you have something that you do daily, like in the morning, or do you have like a weekly set of meetings or maybe even an annual retreat? What does, what does that look like for you? 
I love this idea of an annual retreat. I know, right? Actually, we should got to go to the She Recovers event in September. Yes. I was going to ask you about that later. <laughs> That's my annual retreat. Um, so two things, two things that I do. Well, one, I meditate every day. Like that is something that I think you told me this, that meditation is one of the ways that we can change our kind of set point, like our, mm-hmm. what we go back to. And so, and I found that to be exceptionally true, which we can talk a little bit more about later, uh, while I was going like navigating really challenging life situation. It was the one thing that saved me because I could continuously go within versus, um, go out, look outside of myself, because I feel like all the answers are within us, you know? And so it, that's something that really helped me. So I would love to say that I physically move my body, but lately that's not been the case, (laughs) even though I feel better when I do it. Um, and it's one of those things that I'm like, I really need to start getting back into that. Even if it's 20 minutes, because I do Mm -hmm. feel physically better. Um, this last few months have just been I just haven't got, I just haven't done it daily. Um, but in a perfect world, I would meditate daily, move my body daily, and then take a bath at the end of the day with like Epsom salts and just decompress at the end of the day. That's something that's really healing for me. Um, but now the only thing I do daily is meditate. How, so what does your meditation practice look like? Cause I know some people do silence. Some people do music. Some people do guided. What does yours look like? So mine is either a guided meditation or a music. So I'll find sound bowls or um, some sort of sound healing on YouTube and I'll listen to that or I'll do a guided meditation. I just found an app called Aura, Hmm. A-U-R-A, and it has live meditations. It has guided meditations. It has music. It has like, you can sign up for a coach if you want. Like it has all these different options. And so I'm doing a trial of that and I like it because it has five minutes or it has up to one hour. And so that's been helpful for me in those when I'm like, I just need five minutes. And, you know, because I'm the queen of, well, I don't have time. If I can't do it, you know, for example, exercise is something like if I don't exercise for an hour, it doesn't count. And it's like at the end of the day, (laughs) that's brutal. Or if I don't meditate for 30 minutes, it doesn't count like that. So I'm trying to, um, change the mindset around that and say, like, Mm -hmm. even if I move my body for 10 minutes, it counts. I mean, you know, coming from an athletic background, like that, that's a lot or, but so now this aura has also helped me because for five minutes, I can put my earphones in for five minutes and kind of reset. And sometimes I just need a little bit of that, like a little reminder that that's okay. And I remember somebody told me that I don't have time really means this is not a priority. So thinking about making something a priority has really helped me and then giving my per- myself permission to either do a sh- five minutes and let it be shitty. You know, there, I have this idea that like it needs to be perfect or it needs to be <laughs> right. And I Just think it, it also, five minutes. yes. And I think it also comes back to like, what's the intention, you know? So like mm. intention is always really important. Like I'm checking out for these five minutes through the meditation because I recognize that I need to reset or I'm giving myself 10 minutes to move my body because that is the time I have right now between, you know, running a business and having time with my children and practicing self-care, like all of the things. And so it's like the attention behind it of giving us that grace to say, I know what I need. I don't have an hour, but I'm going to do five minutes and that's going to be okay today. You know? Uh, Yeah. You said the magic word for me, which is grace. Let's give give ourselves a little bit of grace. The hard charger will always be there to drive us insane. (laughs) I remember we were doing our pre-call, pre-interview chat. And I was like, oh my God, you're like my sister from another mister. (laughs) We had all the same, all the same dysfunctional coping strategies. (laughs) Oh dear. Helps me feel Um, good. What was that? It helps me feel less alone. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Conversation. I was like, oh, good. Yeah. It was so good. I love it. Um, let's see. What's one, one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober 15 years ago? If you can remember, <laughs> <laughs> that's a long time ago. Don't sweat the small stuff. Mm, I mean, sometimes so the small good. stuff is the big stuff, right? Like the little things that we can do. But I remember getting wrapped around the axle about things that were like, 
Or, so this this example I heard, and this was me. So this woman the other day, she was brand new. She had like a month. Um, and she was sharing about how she wishes she could say no to commitments that she that she was offering to pick up people from I'm not breaking, you know, she she's like, I'm taking all these people to meetings and now I'm running ragged. Now I'm exhausted and I can't. And I, I looked at her like, just say no, you know, but like that was me 15 years ago. It was like, I wanted to help all the, everybody. And so it was like, but then I was running myself, but it was like the clearest answer in the moment. And I was like, just, just tell them. Cause indeed I live in DC, you know? So I like to go to like Northeast to go all the way to the other Southeast to go to mid, then to go to Arlington, like to drive all over. It could take hours. I just remember being like, just let it go. <laughs> let it go. I think, like, let it go. I think that, so I just remember, um, but it's really right. Like I look back on life and I was like that as a little kid too. Like I would get so wrapped up and worried about all the things that like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, and that comes back to like gratitude for me. Cause there are some days like I could still find myself getting wrapped around the axle about fill in the blank, like anything. And then I'm like, okay, what am I grateful for? And some days it is literally like I had hot coffee this morning. Mm. I have a roof over my head. I got to take a hot shower. You know, I have money in my bank account to buy my son Christmas gifts. You know, I mean, there because there's always like, I'm a little emotional today. Sorry. Oh, don't always, apologize. There's always room to want more, but it's mm. always a good reminder that I could have so much less. Yeah. And so I think like, maybe that's it, you know, like be kind of like in the in early sobriety, I just... And this is a good reminder for today, like embrace the process, right? Like be Ooh. where you are, because even now, like you and I talked about this, I think we're talking about a little later, like, you know, I went through, um, challenging, challenging <laughs> the, last, the last year. And even this morning I was talking to someone like, I should be further ahead. I should be fine. I should be. And it's like, when I start to should myself, it's when I goes back to that grace. Like I just need to allow myself grace in embracing the process because I, it's taken me 15 years to get to a place where I can look at myself in the mirror and say, I love you. Like I, like, I remember when I first got sober, they said, go home and look at yourself in the mirror, meet your eyes and say, I love you. And for the life of me, I couldn't do it. I could not look at myself and now I can, you know, but that's 15 years. And so yeah. it's like a process. And so as hard as, it, as hard as it is, cause I want to arrive. Like I want to be where I think I should be or where I want to be versus embrace the process and be in the moment. And still that's hard for me, but I wish I think looking back, that's the one, that's the best piece of advice I could have given myself. Like just be in the moment, know that there are going to be mistakes, that nothing is perfect. And as long as I don't drink today, then it's a successful day. Everything else can fall into place and lie, you know? Yeah, no, that is so huge. And um, embracing the process is not easy when we're so achievement oriented and we're so, you know, image management oriented you know, trying to keep up appearances. And so, you know, we don't want anybody to know what's really going on on the inside. We're not really taught that that's okay. You know, and you have had such a, you know, you've had a rough time and we're going to be speaking about some things. And I just want to share that the intention is never to hurt anybody. We're just, you know, being open and honest because there will be people that are, there's a lot of people that whose relationships don't survive sobriety. Right. And there's many challenges because we change, we become our true selves in sobriety. And, um, and, and sometimes the, you know, drinking is medication to tolerate things that are intolerable. And once we stop drinking, then other things fall away sometimes. So, and, um, you know, you've had some loss, you had a lot of loss. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, I want to ask you one last question before we, you know, I'm going to, we're jumping, going to jump into your, if I wish I could talk this morning, <laughs> I think I had too much caffeine, sorry. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about maybe some spiritual experiences that if you've had 
gift. So, and the purpose of that is to help people identify their own spiritual experiences. Cause sometimes I think, um, when we hear other people's stories, we can look back on our lives and go, Oh, maybe there was something there the whole time, you know, carrying me through the difficult times. And you can share about it in any way that makes sense to you, but what does a spiritual experience look like in your life? So I have to say, I think the biggest spiritual experience that I've had is the fact that I'm still alive. (laughs) I mean, and that sounds funny, but like, you know, there has to be something greater than myself that was protecting me from all of the things because I was a blackout drinker. Um, I would drive, I would, you know, do things that I'm, I'm shocked that I'm not that more, more bad things didn't happen. You know, if that's, if that makes sense, like I'm, I'm eternally grateful and blessed that I am here, here today to share the story of hope for others, because I was a blackout drinker and there are days I'd wake up and I'm like, I don't know how, what, where am I? And how did I get here? And like, look at like, cause it was a flip phone era when I was still drinking. So it's like, <laughs> you had a cell phone like (laughs) that text from you know like the phone and and um there day I mean so I think that's a huge spiritual experience just knowing that I'm you know that there's something outside of myself that's been protect that was protecting me if I drank for 15 years now I've been 15 years sober so I'm kind of coming on the other side of that um and I think There have been, I I say there are no coincidences and there are a lot of coincidences that happen or there are things that I'm like, there's no way to explain that. And I'm trying to think of, but I feel like, and you and I have talked about this, the more I look for those things, the more I see them, you know, Mm -hmm. like um, there's like thinking there's no way that could have happened or there's no way that I met this person by accident or, you know, I met this person that led me to this person that ended up being one of my biggest spiritual teachers in my life just by it just by happenstance. So I think, um, God, universe, source, higher power, like whatever it is, we choose to call something greater than ourselves is always delivering little moments into our life. It's just whether or not I am aware of them or grateful for them to acknowledge them, you know, if that makes sense, but I think they're happening all the time. Um, was there a moment that you can think of where you were just like, there's no way that could have happened unless there was a power in this universe that loves me or made you feel connected. No, I mean, <laughs> that's too big of a question. <laughs> no, I mean, like this, you know, we talked about like briefly and we can dive into it more, but like this last year, I mean, there's no way, like, I mean, this last year was one of the most challenging. And I thank God every day that I had 15 years of sobriety, because if I had less, I don't know that I would have not made it. I mean, that sounds really dramatic, but, um, I don't know that I'd be like coming out the other end as strong as I am now, if there wasn't someone else, that was something else that was guiding me. And because at every turn, like, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. I don't know how I'm going to, um, have money to pay my rent this month. I don't know how I'm going to, and it would just happen. You know, I mean, things would just a new client would come in or two new clients would come in or um, it was just, it was a lot of rebuilding this year. And I know Mm -hmm. that that wasn't me alone. Do you want to say what you're rebuilding from? I mean, so this year, yeah. So I was, I, this year I finalized a um, a divorce. So I went through a divorce this year, which meant my son and I moved. Um, I launched a business because I was, essentially a stay at home mom with my son. Um, and for things I won't go into, like I left with a suitcase, my son and my laptop basically. Um, Mm -hmm. so I started over this year. Um, then my dad passed away unexpectedly about two months, about six weeks ago. Um, so so within one year I went through four of the top five stressors in any person's life in about like 350 days. (laughs) And you did it sober. I did it sober. And there's yeah. a point when I, I think I, I can share this. I used to smoke cigarettes when I was drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I <clears throat> went, my dad's, you know, I went and I, I bought a pack of cigarettes and 
my mom's like, why don't, <laughs> bless my mom. She's like, so she goes, can you just have a cup of coffee? Like, wouldn't that make you feel better? And I was like, okay. all right, Say I'm going to tell you something. Let me tell you. Um, <laughs> coffee is how I wake up in the morning. And I was like, what I want to do right now is go to the bar, get really wasted, sleep through dads. Like there are things I want to do that are not, that are not healthy. This is, <laughs> this is the best thing I can choose. Like, okay. 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 <laughs> I think when you told me the story, I, I had to share my, uh, my tagline yes. that sort of encapsulates my using experience was that if it was in a bottle, a bag or blue jeans, I was doing it. <laughs> Ah, that was my response. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I wanted to escape. Like I didn't because yeah. feeling feelings sometimes are really, really hard and feeling all that grief and sadness and loss at like one time it's like, there's only so much a person can take. And so that's when I'm like, there has to be something greater than myself that guided me through this and got me through the other side, not only <laughs> in a healthy and constructive way, <laughs> like without the bottle without, res- Eugene. <laughs> without resorting to the coke dealer <laughs> without yes. this, yeah. bless your heart <laughs> without doing any of those things yeah um, any of those people <laughs> and it, you know because this end came out and, and and yes now looking back I'm like thank you god thank you yeah. higher power thank you source thank you thank you whatever for getting me through that and making the decision that was like in everyone's best interest. It's so funny. It's funny to think about. <laughs> I think we laugh because it would be too easy to cry. Yeah, no. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, in all fairness to you, you've been doing the work of self-care and recovery for 15 years, right? It's like, I've always heard that every action that we do, every action of self-care is like putting a deposit in the bank. And girl, you have had to make some withdrawals this damn year. I love that. Cause yeah. Cause there are some days when it's like, I feel good. Why do I need to take care of myself? I feel good. Why do I need to go to a 12 step meeting? I feel good today. Why do I need to do that? And that's a great point. It's doing the things consistently. So like mm-hmm. when we have stuff to fall back on or when hits the fan, we do curse. Oh like, yeah. I swear like okay. a sailor. <laughs> okay. I was like on here, like when shit hits the fan, <laughs> you have those things to fall back on, you know, and it's not like yeah. scrambling to find a phone number of someone to call because you haven't built those connections or you don't, you know, you don't have a self-care practice or you don't have a meditation practice, you don't have a prayer practice or gratitude, like all of the things we do every day. So they become second nature. So the times when I really need them, they're already there. Yeah. I mean, it makes so much sense. And from like a neuroscience perspective, it's like, if we get into the habit while we're feeling good, um, you know, when we get triggered, what that really means is that your nervous system gets hijacked and then you actually cannot think clearly. You can't even remember who your friends are to call them. Right. But if you are in the habit of doing it, when you feel good, then it's much easier. It's not easy, but it's much easier to call when you feel bad because if you, so that's why I always tell people, you know, call when you feel good. Cause when you feel bad, it'll be impossible if you're not in the habit. I love that. I make my girls do willingness calls. I call them call when you feel good. Like, and the format of the willingness call is you just call somebody and I let them, Arlene is making me do willingness calls. Like they all get it. (laughs) They call each other, but it's like, so you just, how are you? Right. Like what's going on in your world? Here's a little something that's going on in my world. And then you're all cut up. And then it's like, oh, I just have a couple minutes. That's kind of how we preface the call. Just quick check in. But sometimes, you know, you'll catch somebody right when they need to talk and then we feel useful and there's that connection and it's that connection that is really so powerful for healing. Don't you think? hundred percent. And I tell people like women that I work with who they get the sponsors and I'm like, just call me when you like, well, I don't want to. And I remember feeling that way. I don't want to bother you. I'm like nine times out of 10, I'm stuck in my head thinking about something I don't like, or you will save me. Like, you'll save me. Like this is From really, because, yeah. Cause I'm usually like, you know, creating some, and I do it less and less, right? Like the more yeah. time we, like, I'm usually creating some drama or a fight with <laughs> someone, you know, or like thinking about something that's happened in the past that's over. I just need to like, let it go. Like, so you're like helping me break that cycle of like, 
and this is where meditation helps me too, like be in the moment, like, okay, can't do anything about that. That's not happened yet. Deal with it then. But it's also like, there's still a little bit of that residual trauma, I guess, from, from being an alcoholic, like always walking around with my fists up. Like I always felt like I was walking around waiting for something to happen. So I was always like, I got to be prepared. I got to be imagined. So what if this person says this, then I got to have a comeback and then I got to, you know? And so it was like, and now this learn it, this has taught me to be like, you know, the terms, like, I remember, um, sharing this and someone said to me, all you have to say is, huh, I didn't think of it that way. You could be right. And I was you like, could be right. What? Like, no, I had to tell them what I think of that and that, that they're not. And they were like, you don't actually yeah. like, would you rather be right or be happy? And I was like, it depends. <laughs> Both. <laughs> like, but you don't have to like win, you know, all the things you don't have to, sh- you know, show up to every fight you're invited to. You don't have to win every fight you're invited to. You don't. And I was like, says who, but like these things that you learn and it makes life easier. Yeah. He sees fighting everyone and everything. That's one of the lines out of the 12 step literature. So what good. Is- we cease fighting everyone and everything. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I think it's 12 step literature. I could be wrong. I read a lot. So half the time, I don't know where all these things go from. I'll have to beg forgiveness on that one. Well, listen, that was our lightning round. I told, I told you it wasn't going to be fast, <laughs> but I think it's, I think it leads for a good conversation. So um, I want to transition a little bit to talking about your experience, man. I just feel like it must've been so unique. Like everybody's story is unique, but uh, you have a brother who is an Olympic athlete, probably one of the most recognizable. Um, but I'm just so curious about people's family of origin, because I feel like it sets the stage for the rest of our lives, you know, like the conditions that we grew up in, the mindsets, the belief, the family values kind of sets the, sets the stage. So, um, And of course we can look at this through the lens of recovery. So you can start wherever you would like to, but I'm curious, I'll be curious to know, like when you started drinking and, and, and why you started drinking too. Yeah. I mean, I started when I was 14, I don't remember the first drink, um, specifically, but you know, I remember, so growing up, I mean, I was the, I guess I was a straight A student and I was the fastest swimmer in the country at my age uh, when I was younger. So it's really good in both um, academics and athletics. I mean, the bat, like the best and like the perfect yeah. child. <laughs> yeah. But I never felt good enough. Like there was something in Still. me that didn't feel good enough or smart enough, funny enough, pretty enough, like never felt like good enough. And, um, and I think that started to like, I remember a moment, right? Like, and so maybe this in your trauma, I think your trauma informs like special. So like when I remember being in middle school, I changed schools and I was always like, did my own thing and marched to my own beat. Like just love. I was a very, I don't know, eclectic if that's the word, but like, I remember wearing these ballet slippers and these girls like just made fun of me. And I, they were like blatantly made fun of me at this new school. And I, I remember being like, that's so mean. Why? And instead of having that, I don't care. Like I like myself the way I am. I allowed their impression or interpretation of me to be louder than my own. And that was like the first instance I remember in allowing someone else's opinion to be greater than my own of myself. And so I mean, even in sixth grade, then I was getting, I shared this before, like I had this, I read Jane Eyre in sixth grade and I got an A plus plus on the book report, you know, it's like this massive book. I mean, and but I loved it. Like I loved the challenge. And so when I started drinking, we'd moved to a different school so I could be closer to a pool. Cause I was the oldest in my family. I was a great swimmer. My sister followed, my brother followed because my parents were driving us an hour to the pool every day, each way. Um, but I think, you know, and I was also like, because the way my fam- my parents were raised, we were taught to look good on the outside and keep it quiet on the inside. Like if you're hurting or oh. like, you don't talk about things, you don't share them with friends. You don't, you know, if you're upset, like it's not something we talked about it in our family, but you know, like it wasn't, 
no, no, you're fine. And my grandmother was like that to my mom. So it's like that past like learned behavior. And so, um, and so I quickly learned like, okay, just don't talk about it. And so I think for me, that started a process of just kind of self-medicating because I already didn't feel good enough. I already, you know, was like, keep stuffing, right? We talk about this and the drinking too, like just pour alcohol on top of these feelings and eventually they come out and, you know, and so I drank and then I, swimming's not cool. Like I wanted to be cool. Swimming was not, you know, swimming like, wasn't cool. No, I mean, I mean, you're amazing shape. Yeah. But we're in Baltimore. So it was like lacrosse was really big soccer, like all uh. these team sports really popular um, swimming wasn't like swimming wasn't a high school sport where we were. Um, and so we kind of then felt, you know, exceptionally unique and not in a good way. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I swam and, and or I drank and I swam and I didn't like beer. And so we would play like the, Hey, Mr. Game with a, with a friend of mine that ended up, she was the one that helped me get into um, sobriety. She's the one I talked to her. She was one of the first people I talked to because it was around my space. Like, do you remember that? My space. Oh my God. My space. <laughs> and so it was like, you could put on there, do you drink and do you smoke? And she put no and no. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're so you're lying. Cause I used to drink and smoke with you all the time. Like and I remember reaching out to her and she's like, well, I had to quit drinking because, and this, and it resonated when she goes, my elevator is, your elevator is going down. You can choose to get off at any time. Ooh. And she's like, cause it's not going to get better. It's going to keep getting. And I was like, oh my gosh. And that was something that really resonated with me. Like her saying that to me. And I later learned in the rooms of recovery that, you know, your elevator goes down, but the steps are what take you back up. So working. Oh, that's- so good. Okay. So we are 12 step oriented, which I love. Obviously I'm a huge advocate. I I'll just say that I know that there's other ways, but that, so when did you, um, tell me a little bit about the drinking part. Like when did your drinking, when did you know that your drinking was a problem? Uh, probably. I mean, in college, I get, I get, I guess it was an intervention. Um, looking back as an intervention, um, and they they kind of laugh about it. But I started, you know, in college is a great place for an addict and alcoholic to kind of hide and hang out because there's so much drinking on college campuses. Um, you can usually find someone to drink with you. Our, our sports teams, we were big drinkers. Um, and so my senior year of college, my college roommate sat down and they were like, We're really concern with how you're acting. Like this isn't you and we don't like it. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember. And I was like, well, pff, screw you. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, this is me. If you don't like me, that this is your fault, you know, and kind of had that attitude of I'm not giving this up. Um, and we ended up making a, I mean, we ended up being friends and, but that didn't stop my drinking. My drinking continued, but that was the first time that someone had brought it to my attention as it being an issue. So I was maybe 22, 21, 22, my senior year of college. Um, and I got sober at 29. So a couple more years of experimenting. Um, but then after that, I'd find myself in really dysfunctional and toxic relationships because I was a mess, you know, but there's someone for everybody. (laughs) And I found the ones that were like willing to take on dysfunction, you know, and usually because they're not, you know, we usually attract what we are. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't very healthy. And so I was attracting, you know, men that weren't particularly healthy, whether that meant that they were addicts themselves, or they came from um, an alcoholic family and they hadn't healed from that trauma. And so, um, you know, I found myself in a relationship with a man who was smoking marijuana all the time. So he'd just smoke weed and I would just drink and we just existed. It was like, no, <laughs> It was just like, was what it was, you know? And so then he was like, you have a problem. And I was like, you're my problem. And I broke up with him and that was it. It was like, there was nobody that was going to take that away, you know, the drinking away from me. And, um, mm. and three weeks later, is in another relationship, like right away with another, you know, guy who, um, who had, came from an alcoholic family. Um, but he got me sober, you know, we don't talk now. We're not, it was not, not in any way a healthy relationship, but he got me to therapy 
because we were in um we've been dating for I think it's like three months and he was like we should go to couples counseling because this isn't working out <laughs> three months of dating it's a bad sign we should just break up like <laughs> you all how about that therapy but I was like you're right because this is this is my this is my this guy's gonna save me so I'm gonna try to save the relationship by going to therapy and it's it, really it, hot it, no no <laughs> I mean look no it was like the it was not even a healthy it was like no chance like not even a healthy relationship but I mean but he got me sober, got me to the therapist that introduced me to 12 step recovery. And, um, I wasn't ready. I went and I was so, cause I walked in and these people were talking about real issues, you know, and what I realized was now, um, is that we're as sick as our secrets. So anything that we keep inside is just holding us back from getting, so, you know, sober or healing or whatever that, you know, whatever. And so this woman was sharing about her history and about abuse and about drinking. And I was like, you don't talk about those things openly. You keep that, mm -mm, like button it up and swallow it down. Like, don't talk about those things. And so I wasn't ready. And I did this dance of like in and out and in and out. Um, until I, um, until he came to me, the same guy. And he's like, I'm going to tell your family how bad you are if you don't get help. And I was able, and they knew I had a problem. I mean, they knew I was drinking Your family a lot. knew you had a problem. I mean, I don't know if they knew I had a problem, but I would get really drunk at family functions, but I don't know if they knew I got drunk every other time. Like, I'm not sure, like, cause we never really talked about it, but him saying, I'm going to tell your family how bad you are felt really shameful. And I didn't want them to know that I'd been, you know, hiding and in so much pain and like, mm. and so, um, we ended up breaking up and I ended up moving to DC and I was living on my own for 10 days. And it was like, it felt like 10 years. I mean, the drinking and kicking, getting kicked out of bars and like, cause I was on my own. I had nobody to monitor anything, you know? Cause when I was living with these dysfunctional guys, at least they had some, at least I was like, I got a little bit of like a check or like a monitoring, you know, but like you had a handler, I, you had a handler. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Cause you, you said something and I was like, Oh, that's it right there. You mentioned, um, not wanting to let your family know that you were in so much pain. Do you, can you articulate what the pain was about? Um, it was just like emotional pain. Like I just felt, I think it was I would just felt so much like it was depression. Like I was diagnosed with depression later in sobriety. Um, and I just didn't know how to navigate it. Like I didn't know how to ask for help. I felt really stunted. You know, I didn't know, like, I just felt almost like a child, you know, like, um, like lost. Never thought about that before I felt really lost yeah. and there's part of it. And, um, that felt shameful and even asking for help because you know, I'm at that point, you know, maybe 27, 28, I should have my shit figured out by now, mm, you know, so then, much shame. Yeah. And I think even that goes to now a little bit, it's like, there's okay. a huge part of me that I'm like at 44, I'm starting my life over and that feels really hard. You know, and so there was like a huge part of that, like, and for, you know, we shared like about being open about recovery. Like that was one of the impetus. Cause it was like, that's like the one thing that I was like hiding or felt shameful of still. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and it was like, but I, I don't look at anybody else as being shameful. I look, you know, I'm so proud of everybody, you know, anybody that gets sober and I'm so proud of anybody that asks for help. And I have so much, you know, and I would do anything for anybody. And it was in that moment this year that I was like, I should let people be that for me because it, you know what I mean? Like there is a of reciprocation course. of it. Yeah. And so, um, I think a lot of it is just like shame for, um, self-imposed ideas of perfection 
But if you asked me what my idea of perfection was, I'd be like, I don't know. And if I met it, it would change. If I said, you know, like if once I, this is perfect, then once I got there, I'd be like, oh no, no, it's not. And it's, so it's like redefining what like this is. Cause it's not perfection. Like it's just achievement or I don't know. Yeah. That's the hard part is deciding what's okay. Like what's okay. I think we all have these ideas of not good enough. I'm not lovable because I'm either um, too much or I'm not enough. Right. Like those are like the original wounds that we carry. Um, and, and the, and the other part of that is I'm alone in this. It's, there's so much of our conditioning. If you've been conditioned to, um, isolate while you're in pain, then of course, when our emotions get hijacked, we're going to fall to our default, which is isolate. Like, don't ask for help. Don't tell anybody what you're going through because it's okay for all y'all, but not for me. I know yeah. because there's no timeline on healing sometimes. And so it's like, I don't want to continuously talk about it because we've talked about it, like the victim, like, and then am I playing the victim in this space or am I like really asking for help? And so it's like also that oh. voice in the head that's okay. That is so good that you articulated that so well. Am I playing the victim or, and I wrestle with this too. Am I practice? Am I indulging in self-pity or am I showing courage and my vulnerability? Yes. Yes. Wow. And that's hard because it's like, hard. I've talked about this, you know, especially these last, this last year, like, okay, I've been talking about, and I say this to my friends, like there are times they, they'll call and I'm just like bursting into tears. Like what's wrong. I'm like, I don't want to burden you with this anymore. Cause I've been talking about this for six months. I've been carrying this pain for six. And they're like, it's only been six months. So like, what do you mean? You should <laughs> stop having that level of perfection. Like you crossed, crossed it off your list. You should be fine now. You know, but I it's should like be fine now. <laughs> Wait, uh, still human. That sucks. <laughs> do that little self check. Ah, shit. I'm still human. That. Yeah, in early sobriety. Yeah. That's because I I remember at six months I had a craving. Like it was um this time, my first year. I had six months of sobriety. It was on Christmas time, and I love Christmas. And I was like, and I walked past this restaurant in Dupont Circle, going to I was going to a meeting, and there are these couples, you know, sitting around a fireplace with their big goblets of red wine got, you know, and I was like, they have the best life ever. You know, who knows? Like, who knows what their life is like that guy, they can, who knows? Who this knows? Could, that's what's going on there. But in my mind, this was like the best life ever. And they were having it. I was never going to have that. Therefore, like why, you know, shame spiral. And yeah. it's like, and I remember thinking, I remember, and I walked into the meeting that night and I said, I just had a craving and I should be past this now. I am six months into this program and I should not be. And they were like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh, but I was, I was told, be surprised. Don't be shocked when people get loaded, be surprised and they stay sober. Yeah. And, and, and you know, when you were telling that story, I was like, oh, that's the whole judging my insides based on somebody else's outsides. Man, that early sobriety, that's a doozy, isn't it? It is. And that's when people are like, oh, I, I you know, I only have six months. I'm like, only? Oof, that's that the hardest hard. part. That's hard. First that's three a huge months, accomplishment. Gosh, first three months, I think were the hardest, then six, then one year. And then I remember at 18 months, it was like, and I just had to make some changes. Cause I was like, is this it? This is it. Yeah. But like, I yeah. wasn't going to enough for me. I wasn't going to appropriate an adequate, number of meetings. I wasn't doing the work. I wasn't like, there were things that I could do better. Like, so I know mm -hmm. what the issue was, but did you ever hear that saying a uh, pain is a touchstone of all growth? <laughs> She's rolling her eyes. It's annoying. It's Spiritual <laughs> rudeness. <laughs> There's that Gloria Steinem quote that I love. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. I love <laughs> So good. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. So um, tell me, is there, a, is there a story around how you got sober? Like, did you have to go to rehab? Was there a moment, did you have like a moment of clarity or were you just like, fuck this, I'm, I, I gotta quit? 
Well, you know, I'd gone in and out of 12 steps a couple of times here or there and um, kind of did this dance of like needing to do more research because I would I would go in, but I wouldn't do what I needed to do to stay. You know, I'd kind of like check the box. I'd be like, I'm here, mm. here, like I should be. Please endow me with sobriety. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I here. paid my money. Where's my sobriety? My dollar. Give me my, like, yeah. And it was just like, and I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I don't think I was ready. I just wasn't ready. And so how did you know to, how did you know to go to 12 step meetings? The therapist that I went to. For oh, a couple right, right, right. They said, she go there. Like, want to go? And I was like, no. <laughs> like, Why did you go? Because she was like, because we'd gotten into an exceptionally tumult, we'd gotten to a big fight and she went in, she's like, do you think, do you think you need to go? And I was like, I don't know. I don't think so. Like I'm scared. I was scared. I didn't mm. know what to expect. Like, cause you know, there's the image of trench cones and basements with old men, you know? And it's like, not wrong. Like, <laughs> Minus a trench coat. And like 15 years ago, it's like, yeah. and so she's like, I'll go with you. So she went, with <gasps> your therapist went with you to a meeting. That's how I went to my first one. She went with me. It was like, I know everyone is like, oh my gosh, she's in great. Yeah. She's like, when do you want to go? I was like, I don't know. Like, when do they, I remember going, I don't know. When do they have them? And she's like 24 seven. She's like, what about on a Sunday? And I was like, next week, she's like, do you want to go tomorrow? And I remember being like, okay. So I drove and met her at her office and we drove together to the to the meeting and I sat in the back and um I just wasn't ready like I would go maybe once a week and just kind of like I just did I just wasn't ready and so when I moved to DC and the, my ex said I'm going to tell your family he's like I think you need to go to treatment and I remember like I can't go to inpatient because then everybody will know mm, yeah like they don't already right <laughs> I was like maybe I'll go to out this and he, I think he had done the research and said they're, they're outpatient. So you can go after work. And I looked into one, there was one near me. Maybe that's, this is such a God moment. Actually, we talked about spiritual experiences. So I was working in the, in a, in a, um, an office I lived in DC and it was like, I just lived in this triangle. So like, here's my house, here's my office. Here's a, you know, the 12 step meeting. And I would just lived in this like triangle. It's all I did for eight weeks. Every day I would have to leave at 515 to, to walk down to this, to the treatment center. It was really close for a 530 check-in. We'd go in and the ninth week, no joke. I did this every day for eight weeks. As soon as the program was over, then I started going once a week to our continue. It's just called continuing care. So I'd go five days a week, five days, four for eight weeks. And then I go to continuing care once a week, which is just like a two hour group therapy check-in. A doctor was there, you know, and I was on the elevator, not going to this, but going to another, just a 12 step meeting. And my boss goes, you know what? It's really early for you to leave. I think you need to stay a little bit later today. And didn't happen at all during those eight weeks. Didn't happen at all. But it was like, and it was a day that I could stay. And maybe, I mean, right now I'm like diminishing it. Well, maybe it wasn't, but it was like it was because every day for eight weeks, she never asked where I was going early, why I was leaving at 515. You know, you need to stay a little bit longer at not at all. And then right after it was over, it's like you need to stay a little bit later tonight. And I was like, um, oh, so you, so that was like a, your literal grace period. Amazing. Um, but so I'd, I'd gone to outpatient and then they kind of connect you into the, like, um, graduated people that you could go to meetings with. Um, okay. so I did that and, and I got the numbers of some women. Um, I, and I went to a couple like NA meetings or just a different, a different, oops, um, 12 That's step. Fine. Yeah. A different 12 step program. And I kind of, um, but I ended up finding, you know, ones that I liked. I didn't like women's meetings at first. I didn't either. It's so funny. A lot of us don't like women's meetings at first, but now that's like almost all I go to. Well, I wasn't the kind of woman I wanted to hang out with. So why would I want to go hang out in a room full of women? <laughs> Man, I think I didn't go because I was so conditioned to seek external validation from men that it wasn't satisfying for me to go to women's meetings. I, I just didn't relate. 
And now I love women and I want to always go to women's meetings. I do still love my homeboys, but it's different. 100% same. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's been 15 years. Um, you've been through so much. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's not always easy. Can I ask you what, you know, we're conditioned in 12 step programs to remain anonymous and it can be scary. I always felt that, uh, sharing my sobriety with people was sort of a coming out sort of thing. Right. And I had to choose when and where to share that with people. What was it about this time in your life? Uh, you know, you started sharing your sobriety publicly six months ago. Uh, what prompted that? And Ben, um, I think part of it was just, I still felt a little bit of unsure, like just a little bit of shame and I wasn't sure. And then in, you know, in a relationship that I was in, I was told not to, not to ever tell anybody it was embarrassing. We should never share those things. Like, and so it was kind of a reminder too, of like growing up, like you keep those things inside and look good on the outside. And so I struggled with that because I felt like I was straddling these two different lives, right? Like who, wait, who knows, or who doesn't know, or who, you know? And so, um, when this, relationship ended it felt another god moment another spiritual awakening whatever that is a friend came to me and said i have a podcast do you want to share your story and it was the first time i shared my story openly publicly and it was during mental health awareness month in may and i said to him we'd gone to college together he has 10 years sober um you know and i was coming up on 15 and it just seemed like the right time and i said to him had you asked me one month earlier i would have said no and it was just, again, like one of those divine timings when it felt like the time was right. Because I also had that, like, what if I was like, what if all of my friends don't want to be friends with me? All the people mm -hmm. that I've, you know, the relationships that I've built after getting sober, what if they look at me and they're like, oh, we don't want to be friends with you now. And that's like, that was a genuine, a genuine concern. And it was the complete opposite. People were yeah. like, I had no idea. Like you're the nicest person. We had no idea you wanted to fight girls in the bathroom or we had no <laughs> idea that you, you did those things because that's not who you are today. And I was like, and I don't think it's who I've ever been, but drinking takes you to those places of being someone else. And so of all of the things that you're not. And, um, and so I decided to speak out because if I lost five friends, but could help. But one person heard the story and was like, you did. I had no idea. Can I get, how did you get help? How can I get help? Um, and I found that the latter to be the case. I haven't found a single person say, and if they are, then, you know, oh, well, because I had yeah. someone come to me this weekend. I was in um, Baltimore with my family and we were at this event and this woman came up to me with tears and she's, cause I just did a piece on the local, on the news station. And she came mm -hmm. up to me in tears and said, I saw your piece. I can't get sober and I don't know what to do, but hearing your story made me feel less alone. And I was like, that's all, that's it done. Like, that's all I right. And her boyfriend was there and he, he had tears in his eyes and he was like, thank you so much for talking to her. She's struggling and we don't know what to do. And I was like, here's my, here's my info. Call me anytime. Call me anytime. That's amazing. What do you need? That's amazing. Do you want to go? Like, yeah. Do you want me to go to a 12 step meeting with you? Do you want me to refer you to like, or do you just want someone to talk to? Do you want right. me, you know, like that's it because the ripple effect, and you know, this, like the ripple effect of one person getting sober, like goes out into the family. It goes out into the community. It goes out into. So everywhere. powerful. So powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And, and that is a, that is a um, decision. And I think if we tune in to ourselves, we know when it's right. And that is like the biggest lesson I've learned in my recovery, my sobriety, and especially this last year. And that's why meditation has been so important to me is that my inner voice and my inner guidance, right. And it goes back to that girl in sixth grade. That was like, your shoes aren't cool. And me, instead of being like, well, I like them. It, right. That was kind of that moment where now, I don't know, 30 years, <laughs> I think 30 years don't make me do math. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at me for answers. I'm not going to help you. That's a lot, you know, it's a, that's a lot to heal from going all the way back that external, mm -hmm. that need for external validation, which is so normal at that age. 
Right. That's, that's when it starts. It's so normal at that age, but finding ourselves again in recovery. That's, I had a sponsor once tell me that recovery was about recovering your whole self, the good parts and the bad oh, and learning. That. Yeah. She would challenge me. It felt like she was throwing down the gauntlet. She would say, can you learn to love your unlovable parts? And I was all, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? But I've, under, I've come to understand that you cannot exile parts of you. Like you are who you are and we can try to deny or shove it down, but there, there will always be, you know, those parts of us that need our love that we need to love. So that's for me, what recovery is about. I would love you to share, you know, we were talking earlier about experiences in sobriety, you know, maybe some challenging times and you shared a story about what happened to you when you were one year sober. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this will be your, the time we talk about maybe some unique circumstances. Do you want to share that story? Yeah, well, I had shared. So I just celebrated one year sober and um, we'd got, we went to the Olympics in Beijing and it was when my brother won eight gold medals. And so they're <laughs> so <laughs> casual about that. Yeah. That time my brother won eight gold medals at the Olympics. Amazing. At one year sober, that must've been so, I don't know. What was it like? And that was challenging because Mm -hmm. you're I'm a world away from all of my touch points, right? Like, um, that was when flip phones were, it wasn't like we had FaceTime or those things weren't available yet. Um, texting was, you know, in China, it was like a dollar a text or something. I mean, it was something ridiculous. Like it was really, cause it wasn't inclusive. It was expensive. And so like calling, I mean, there was just so much, there was just so much. And so limitations. So I mean, they think they'd shut down like Facebook, like there was some government over, like, you know, they'd shut down, um, internet. Yeah. Basically shut all that down. And so there's like, can't talk to anybody in the U S and so, um, yeah. And they brought out champagne and wine and that was my drink of choice. Like I loved red wine and I loved champagne and I loved all those things. And I was just like anything wet, basically (laughs) (laughs) with alcohol. Oh my gosh. So I remember standing there, people being like, let's do shots. And I'm like, no, no. Like I was so guarded. So it's like, I just had to kind of, yeah, like still walk around with that extra layer of protection. Cause it was man. And it wasn't tempting. I didn't want to drink, but as you know, only having well, only, but being in that, just passing that first year was, um, it's challenging. I had this, I suddenly had this vision of you being like Wonder Woman. Remember Wonder Woman had the bracelets? <laughs> you know, she would deflect the bullets with these magical bracelets. Yeah. You were, that, you were like that. Wonder Woman deflecting the shots. Oh my gosh. Yes. That so was very, a memory. I really remember that. But yeah. what a, but what I would imagine that that would be, was it a euphoric experience or were you, what was that like when your brother was winning all those gold medals? Was it euphoria? Was it, were you under the microscope? Was the family, were you guys in a fishbowl? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, it was just a fishbowl. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was exciting. It was great. And it was exhausting, you know, but he did and more exhausting for him. (laughs) (laughs) What was the time? What was the time period of the Olympics? Was it like several weeks? It's a week. It was the whole thing is two weeks, but each Uh, there's the first week and the second week and swimming is the first week. Man, that must've been something else. Okay. So you survive the experience at when you're sober. That's amazing. That's another very unique I would argue that the week that you, or the year that you've just had was probably a lot harder than that one. Yeah, actually. Yes. Which just goes to show it's like, it doesn't matter how much time you have. Like life doesn't stop happening. It doesn't change the circumstance. Like life doesn't automatically become rainbows and butterflies and unicorns and perfect, but the way that we navigate the challenges just changes, you know, because we have these tools, like we were talking about, whether it's writing the gratitude list, going to 12 step meetings, talking to another person, like having those touch points at all periods of our life makes the, makes the other, makes the really challenging times, even at 15 years more navigable, navigable, easier. There's that word again. (laughs) 
the word? Not easier, <laughs> easier to navigate. Easier to navigate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's easier to navigate, but it just makes it a little bit more manageable, you know, than for sure. If I'd have, oh man, you know, and I'm grateful for the timing, like that, that wasn't flipped, that my dad didn't pass at the beginning of the year. And then the other things followed. Like maybe that's divine timing because my dad saw me through, my dad was my anchor and my rock and my my biggest cheerleader. And so the, the timing was also, you know, better. I, listen, I, I can, thank you for sharing that. I can, I can, you know, speak from experience that it's so disorienting, yeah. you know, um, when you speak of your dad as the anchor, you know, um, it, it would amount, you know, I don't know, a drift seems like it would be an easy, um, I mean, that's the word that comes to mind is when you lose your anchor, you go adrift. And, uh, I had a similar experience with my mom. She was my, she was my anchor in many ways. She was the one I was performing for basically. And when she passed, it was so disorienting for me because I suddenly didn't feel the need to perform. And I was like, who am I? If I'm not striving to achieve and impress my mom, like my mom, listen, my mom loved me and she was proud of me, but that, you know, idea of needing to, uh, when her approval was sort of ingrained in my mind and my sort of default mode network that, you know, that I always fall back to. So it's been, you know, a difficult year and I know that you've had so much change that, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, you know, feeling lost and feeling disoriented is I would imagine would be part of your experience. Is that a fair statement? I think so. Yes. And then lately how I'm trying to, um, navigate the challenge is by mm-hmm. saying that was my story, but now I'm creating a new one, right? Oh. Like that's not who I am. Like that's an experience that's that's happened to me, but it doesn't define who I am. And that's been really challenging because I, I want to say like, not, I want to, it's easy to say my divorce, my divorce was exceptionally challenging. And that's part of who I am. I lost my dad. That's part of who I am. And it's like, and I can continue to live in that space of having that define me or, or I can choose to say, that's an experience that I had that brought me to today. And now I'm using that to define my future and how it looks for me moving Mm -hmm. forward versus, does that make sense? Like, yeah, that's a, that's a empowered mindset versus a victim mentality. Oh God. Yeah. Now I'm asking for help, but not being the victim, but it's like, Yeah. But that is repetitive. Like that's something that I have to do daily, you know, and saying like, that's not my story. Like it's, it, it happened and it was really hard. It was really hard and it was really sad, but it's like, but I need to, I choose to use this now moving forward as using my voice to help others or, you know, knowing that some choices I may need to think through a little bit longer because I'm relying on these past experiences to make it where that's not where I live anymore, where I'm living here. You know what I mean? So it just, yeah, I mean, it really sounds, it is so hard and it really sounds like, you know, in recovery, we do grow and evolve. Right. And so our identity is something that's more fluid than I think we realize, you know, as we incorporate these different experiences, it does inform our identity. And I feel like that's sort of like a common thread throughout sobriety because the early sobriety experience is who am I now? Like I used to think of myself as a party girl and now I'm the sober girl, right? Like who am I, who am I now? Am I boring? No, it's never boring. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so it was a re um redefining what my identity was and then as you grow in recovery your identity continues to change because i feel like the identity it has a way of blossoming blossoming unfolding developing do you know what i mean and and so as we get more information our identity changes and i love what you said about what is the story i'm going to tell because there's something so powerful in the story as we tell it we're also convincing ourselves of who we are. Right. So I love that you, that's an empowered mindset that you're describing. It's like, how am I going to use this experience to shape who I am? 
and this is something like this is just I just realized this too it's like um oh I just lost it but like part of it was I can I can um define someone like this I can say this this mm. this this about my ex or I can say hey look he's actually been my biggest teacher in life Oh my God, that is so huge. People don't want to I mean, acknowledge. Look, I don't want to say that. Like, I want to say. Yeah, we know what you want to say, but we're not here to hurt anyone. <laughs> but, not, right? and I can, but the evolved, right? The evolved or the empowered is to say, this was really challenging, but this moment has been my biggest teaching moment in my life. Yeah. And I'm going to use that to become, to, to, rediscover my voice to allow my voice to come through more clearly to share my voice more loudly to trust my instinct and then that's going to inform my future decisions but that what you were talking about that's not my default setting that's not what I go to first yeah. <laughs> that takes practice you know what I mean and that's something that is it takes practice it also takes being surrounded by people who can remind you of the good parts when your nervous system is hijacked and you can't think straight, right? That's, that's why we, that's why community is so, and fellowship is so important. It's like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> She's yeah. laughing. Yeah. I, my team, my board, my board of directors, and they're not all in recovery, uh, but they're like good girlfriends that I've developed. And there's one that I go to if I want to just laugh, cause she's amazing. Like, and there's one that I go to I, that I know will always be honest if I'm being a little. Oh, I got those friends. All right, just give it to me straight. And then there's one that's always going to give me the love that I need. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. so they're all one is like always there for the the bad jokes, the cursing, the <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna know, be a mean girl. I yeah, and it's like, but we're all this like tight group, and it's great because I it's like it's balanced. Balanced. Man, a board of directors. I love that. I'm totally going to steal that. We have our board of directors, man. I do have, I cherish my friends. I have, I have a particular girlfriend that comes to mind who will be honest with me, who will just call me on my bullshit. Um, I love her for that. And I know when to go to her. And then I also have other friends that are sort of like have that mom nurturing, gentle, like, oh, honey, what's here? Come tell me, you know, like that sort of mom. I love being the mom role. <laughs> that's my favorite. Actually, that's not true. I like being the um, honest one, but nobody likes her. <laughs> nobody likes that bitch. <laughs> oh, I have that. That's my alter ego named Harriet. <gasps> I have alter ego too. Would you call her Harriet? Named Harriet. And she tells you, she tells the truth. Is she mean? <laughs> so every once in a while, my friends will be like, did Harriet fall asleep? What happened to Harriet? You Why? Because Harriet... you're nice when she's asleep? Because I was made a decision that was like, yes. They're like, all right, listen, where's Harriet when you need her? Get her up. I'm like, Ooh, I like that. I often talk about my alter egos when I was getting loaded the uh, badass Betsy or wimpy Wendy. Cause I was either fighting or crying when I got drunk. Mm -hmm. I had slutty Karen too. <laughs> Did you have that one? <laughs> maybe you don't, maybe you're not comfortable sharing about that one. Karen, I like that. You That's funny. Yeah, that was before the Karen thing happened. The, the, let me speak to your manager. Maybe I need to find a new name for her. <laughs> Karen's getting better up these days. Oh my God. I digress. Um, well, listen, I, I could obviously talk to you forever. I think that first call, our 15 minute pre-call chat was like an hour and a half or two hours. I, I was, I'm always telling my husband when I get off these calls, I'm like, I found a new best friend. He's like, you love everybody. It's fun. No, but really <laughs> this time, no, this one's different. This one's it'll be different this time. Um, listen, um, you're, I am so excited for all the plans that you have and the work that you're going to be doing. I mean, everything happens on time. I love that you have found your voice and you're going to be able to stand on this platform to do the courageous work of helping alleviate unnecessary suffering. I mean, that is really the only work that really matters to me in this world is we need to help each other out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So thank you for finding your voice and sharing all the things. It's so good. I so enjoyed this conversation. Um, where can people follow you, find you, hear more about the work that you've been doing? Um, so I'm on social media. I'm on Instagram at um, Hillary Phelps with one L um, and then underscore um, LinkedIn is where I've been sharing a lot of like interviews and podcasts and things like that. Um, it's just Hillary Phelps. Um, I'm rebuilding my website, but it's currently hillaryphelps.com. <laughs> um, so easy peasy. easy peasy, keep it all easy. And so is your, is your time going to be spent focused on uh, mental health in the corporate environment or is, will, will it be mental health for women or what do you, what do you see that looking like? Do you know yet? I don't know. I like that. I mean, I'm, I'm really right now feeling into like the women, because I feel like my story, I joke that, you know, I have a lot of male friends who have these and some female friends, but the male friends have these like super sensational stories where they were like smoking crack and doing, I mean, just, you're just like, how are you alive right now? I like, know. seriously, how are you alive? Where mine is, you know, I drink two bottles of wine a night and, and then would drink more. And I did things and I, you know, like the, you know, but for the most part, like I feel in my opinion, this is nobody's like, there are a lot of other women who are in that space who are like, I probably drink too much, but it's fine. Cause we all women drink that much or all moms have their sippy cups or all whatever. When it's like, can you stop once you start? No. Okay. That could be a problem. Can you do that? Okay. No. Like, um, but I also feel like there's a lot of shame in women myself, you know, included for the 15 years that I was really quiet about it. So I think I don't, I haven't decided, I guess is my answer, but I really love to focus, you know, women in women that just need help and just need an ear and need to not feel alone. Cause I just yeah. I feel so alone and so sad. And so like, this is the end of my life. And it's so trite to say like, my life has gotten better after I shared it, but my life is so much better than it was. Oh, there comes the sun. Sorry. That's okay. No, that's not trite. I mean, um, I think it's important. I feel like women are held to a higher standard and it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. The feelings are all the same. And that lonely, quiet desperation of drinking alone and knowing that your life is in shambles, but not knowing what to do or how to ask for help. That's a very dark place. So thank you for giving voice to that so that other women can identify and relate and maybe find some solution. That's really the whole point, right? Right. And I feel like to your point, women are expected to work like we don't have kids and raise kids like we don't work. And then you throw on top of that struggling with addiction or struggling with, you know, the not being able to put down alcohol or feeling alone or shameful or depressed or like whatever it is, like there's just so much. And then coming out of the pandemic and lock, you know, all of that and more people dying from alcohol related deaths than any other time in history. And it just keeps going up. Like, I just think that there's, um, a lot of work that can be done. And yeah, you're doing good work. <laughs> Listen, um, I am excited that for, to watch your career and watch all the ways that you're going to help people. Um, if there's anything I can do to help you just let me know. I am your girl, but Hillary, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. And I know I'll talk to you again soon.